I'm Portia Young, and this is the March 2018 edition of 1036 on Milwaukee PBS. In this episode, meet a marathon runner who's racing to help herself and others struggling with an often debilitating disease. And hear how a Milwaukee initiative mentors and inspires young artists to freely express themselves in hopes of keeping many of them on the right path. 300 days. That's how long you have to file a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission if you want to go to court over a sexual harassment incident. But it usually doesn't go that far. Joanne Williams continues our look at sexual harassment in the workplace. She talks with an attorney, a business human resources professional, and a woman who was harassed and fought back. How have the recent exposures of very famous people what kind of impact has that had on the businesses with whom you work? It's a great question. Uh, I'll level with you very little, uh, in my opinion. Um, I think in terms of how it's being handled, they're looking more aggressively at, is our policy up to date? Is our training up to date? But the tone and the culture is still the same. So define sexual harassment for me. I, from a legal point of view, what is it and how do we recognize it? Sexual harassment includes things like unwanted sexual advances, uh, inappropriate touching, sexual comments and innuendos, sexual jokes, comments about a woman's body. There are other forms of what I would call sex harassment that aren't particularly focused on uh, sexual things, but it could be comments like, women don't belong here, this is a man's job. What if the person who is the harasser is the boss? People do sometimes get fired for complaining. And it's probably true that the higher up the harasser is, the greater the fear and the greater the likelihood the person will be terminated. But I say to people, you, you have a choice. You can go to work every day and live with sexual harassment, or you can stand up for yourself and report it knowing that you might get terminated. The tone is set at the top. If there is something going on and it is a leader of the organization who controls terms and conditions, payroll, scheduling, your time off, it makes it that much more difficult. That boss has a boss as well. And you're expected to follow the procedure, have a well-established process, but if you do feel that you can't complain directly to your manager because he or she is engaging in the alleged behavior, you have every right to go over that person's head. We say in writing, you have the right to bring it forward. We can't then go ahead and say, well, you brought it forward, thank you very much, but you're never getting promoted again, or we're going to cut your salary. That's just not something we can do. About two to three percent have, have gone on to court. I've been involved in situations where all the person wants is an apology. If you would just apologize and I could go about my day, that'd be great. Sometimes the person isn't willing to do that. They aren't willing to apologize. They aren't willing to own the behavior and that just entrenches. And people, employees, um, have the right to bring forward issues. They have the right to go to the EEOC, which we always tell them, and they have the right to bring a court case. Belinda Pittman McGee got what she wanted. She runs the Nia Imani Family Center for Young Women, but she used to have a business that cleaned new homes still under construction. When the personal comments from a construction supervisor escalated, she said no. I was um, on the construction site and I needed to go and to see the superintendent. Well, it wasn't the first time uh, that I had to go to the trailer. I was always very cautious in going there because I would be going in and the superintendent usually was in there uh, alone. Over time, he commented on her looks, whether she was married, and finally, would she go out to dinner with him? It was offended to me, so anyway, I says, no, no thank you. Um, this is business, and I have always learned that we don't need to mix the two. He really got upset with me. He got very upset with me, and he told me that Okay, so you must do not want to be able to do this kind of work anymore. And I said, what does that have to do with what you asked me, my work? Well, she got more work, and a few months later, on a reference from another supervisor, got a call from the same man. They met at his office. 
and then he began to talk about the job that he had opening and that he would like for my company to do. And I said, um, I'm not sure if I want to do any more work for you, um, considering what happened in the past. How am I going to be assured that this is not going to happen again? And he says, because I owe you an apology. And he did apologize to me. When he apologized to me, I felt that, hmm, you got your lesson. Did you tell anyone? My workers, uh, my family about it. But did I go to anyone else? No. Because I felt that I handled the situation. It's all about the tone and the expectations set forth by leadership and what happens when issues are brought forward. I mean, let's face it, as long as humans are doing jobs, they're going to say and do dumb things. I do believe that companies will take it more seriously and then start implementing disciplinary action. But for right now, I don't think the complaints are going to go down. I, I think they're going to go up I, because women are going to be more empowered. Younger folks, I think, quite frankly, in my humble opinion, are think to themselves, what's the big deal? We all come to work. We all know each other. The tolerance, quote unquote, level is so high with the younger generation, in my opinion. I think young people are more vulnerable. They are new to the workplace. They aren't as mature as people who have been working for a long time. They're naive. Is sexual harassment about sex? Or about power? Clearly, I mean, you, you can't discount the fact that there are sexual terms used or there's inappropriate touching, but I think ultimately it's about power. The majority of issues that I've dealt with throughout my career and that we're seeing in the newspaper has to do with men harassing women. I often find that the core of those issues is power. Joanne Williams joins us now for some concluding thoughts on this important issue. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Okay, so what do Attorney Scar and Michael Hyatt, what do they mean when they say the word power? They mean that it's not necessarily about sex. It's about having control over somebody else and feeling that, pers that person who knows they could have retaliation won't do anything about it. Mm, okay, so the victims, let's talk about them for a minute. Was it difficult getting them to open up and share their stories? It was difficult at first, but I tell you what, once they started talking, they told us some amazing stories of what had happened to them, and most of them didn't report it. So I'm glad they talked to us, and I'm glad that we were able to bring this information to you. Great. Thank you. And we do have much more information on our website. Just visit milwaukeepbs.org. We have several hotline phone numbers for both employees and employers. Three million adults in the U.S. have been diagnosed with an often debilitating disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says that number is climbing. Marathon runner Megan Starshek knows about this disease all too well. She wants to inspire others struggling with this disease to never give up. I knew what I had by the definition of it. I didn't realize the level that it would affect me. It takes over your whole body. It basically touches every facet of physically, mentally, emotionally. The, the feeling of kind of life happening around me and kind of just this blur as I, as I sat in my apartment alone. I think that's probably the, the worst part is it was, it was just very lonely. beginning the symptoms that I had were pretty bowel related so lots of loose bowel movements a um, little bit of blood in my bowel movements urgency was a big thing fatigue started to catch up with me a little bit you know the pain in your abdomen be just because all of the distress that's going on there turned out to be 
you know, pretty impactful on my life. But also at the time I was getting ready to go off to my freshman year of college. So I was trying to just kind of live as normal of a life as I could. And I was like, you know, it was probably just a bug or it was from traveling or this or that. Um, but they just never went away. And that was, that was the start of it. I'm currently training for the Lakefront Marathon, which is in October. Um, it will be my second marathon ever, and my goal is to qualify for the Boston Marathon. You know, symptoms of ulcerative colitis really started on a run for me and affected my running and years and years of symptoms and then, and then finding the right treatment and getting into remission. This is kind of the, the ultimate for a distance runner is to, is to qualify and run Boston. So. That's the goal. Hey, Megan, how are you doing? Hello. Good to see you today. You too. How are things going for you? Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so the patients we focus on here are patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Uh, and collectively, they're known as inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD. Um, and these are conditions where the body's immune system start attacking the intestines for reasons we don't fully understand. Uh, and this in turn causes ulcers and inflammation and bleeding within the GI tract. Um, as you can imagine, this leads to pain and painful diarrhea and bloody stools for our patients. The cause for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis is not completely understood at this time. Uh, there is certainly a genetic component to it. There are other environmental factors that factor in heavily. Inflammatory bowel disease tends to be a more westernized disease, so as countries develop, uh, and become more first world countries, we see more uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease in it. And there are uh, other factors that people are looking into and a lot of it has to do with the body's immune system and how it interacts with the natural uh, gut microbiome that lives within all of us. And at first when I was diagnosed, it wasn't as emotional as a lot of people, but I was really happy to just have a name for it so we could start treating it. But I remember it hitting me a couple years later, actually, I'm still in college, when your kind of mental framework for disease or for sickness changes because when you're, when you're a kid and you're sick, you take some pills, you get better, and there's, there's a beginning and an end to sickness. And when you have a chronic disease, there's no end. It just it starts and that's it. Um, there's all of these factors in life, and I don't know where I'm going to end up, but I know that when I'm... However old I live to be, I will have ulcerative colitis. And, and that was a moment for me that I'm like, the forever really, really just hit me. You know, that your body's also doing, doing very well. Awesome. So she ultimately was started on a medication called infliximab that uh, is an IV medication that helps suppress the immune system. Um, and ultimately that was able to control her disease. <laughs> I've been good. fortunate to take care of her uh, uh, her since she's been in remission and she's maintained in remission for some time now uh, so she can pursue her work and, and uh, other pursuits such as running. You ready? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Come on, so one thing, thing that I've, I've noticed about my current relationship with running aside from just having to be prepared and, and knowing my body is the, the mental side has has turned into a, a kind of an advantage for me, I think, because you know we'll be doing a hard workout on the track or wherever, and I'll be with my running friends, and they'll be like, "Oh, I'm so tired, I can't, I can't do one more," and I'm like, "You don't, you don't know what tired is. Like, tired is when you." think about do I want to get out of bed to walk to the bathroom or do I just want to stay here because I'm not sure I can make it like that's tired and I know that I always have more by its nature ulcerative colitis is kind of a dirty embarrassing disease and nobody wants to talk about it nobody wants to hear about it and so that's what I expected from people I'm like I'm not gonna tell people because they don't want to hear um, but then I was talking to somebody and he told me that he thought that I was strong and he said that he was impressed after seeing me handle all that I handle and it was the first time that anyone had reacted positively. Feeling grounded in your body, I invite you to think of one thing that you are grateful for today. So I kind of started to realize that 
there were ways that I could communicate that were more positive, like kind of like, yes, I have this disease and there's no cure and it's really horrible and it affects me so much, but I can handle it and this is what I'm doing about it. So I'm not letting myself turn into kind of the victim role of woe is me and feel sorry for me and I can't do anything. Like, um, I still have a life and I'm still gonna live it. I started uh, the Great Bowel Movement with my friend Andrea back in 2010. We realized the, that journey that we had been through to get to the point of, of openness and where you kind of own your disease and own your story um, and that not everyone was there yet. So we started to put out resources, um, a lot of blog posts, some, some infographics to kind of help people. Like it's okay to talk about it. It's not your fault that you have it. You don't have to apologize for it. You don't have to be embarrassed of it. And then all of this misunderstanding you can take away just by telling people who you are and, and what you live with. And there's something so powerful in that. And you know, the more people do it, the, the more awareness there is for the general public. Good, ready to just go get it done. Just nervous a couple days ago, but you know, going through all this stuff, getting my my race bib picked up, getting my outfit picked out, getting all the stuff in order. I'm just like ready to go get it done now. We've been dating for about 10 years now, and uh, tying into that that GI community, the the people with um, IBD uh, and various diseases, and and how they really support each other and that, that's what's impressed me the most knowing her throughout this whole thing not just the marathon training but we've been together for a long time and seeing her really get more and more involved in that community and, and really take control of her life while dealing with a sickness. Good. run a hopefully 3.30. Um, the Boston qualifying time is 3.35 for me, so you need a little bit of a bumper to get under that, to, to get into the race. Um, but also, I just want to feel good, have a good day, be light on my feet, and have a good time out there, and just, just kill it. Nicely done, Megan! I don't know that I've had an athlete that has followed the plan as closely as Megan has. It's been really great to work with her. Um, so she's stayed on top of everything that she's needed to do through this entire training plan. It's been great. I just want her to soak in all of the awesomeness that's going to be today. And of course, we really are hoping that she's going to qualify for Boston. She's ready. She's done all of the training that she needs to do. She's ready. Hey, Megan, get in here. a girl. Marine Source and Megan Starshack. Josh Hogan, Megan, you rock. I thought I'd be more disappointed if I didn't make it, which I didn't make it, but I'm super happy, super proud. Like, marathons are tough, and I felt strong out there. Um, my halftime was a PR for the year, second fastest overall, and I was on pace for 18 miles. Still got eight miles to go after that, which is pretty tough, so a little bit of a headwind today, which didn't help, but again, you control what you can, and deal with what you can't and that's kind of just life there's it doesn't matter how fast or slow you are but just seeing other people get back to it is what kind of fuels the cycle of okay if she can do it you know maybe I can do it really grateful that I am I'm able to do this oh, so proud of you you did such a great job personally I think it's less of worrying about this goal or that goal but I just hope she's very happy with what she's done and and is able to 
look back on all the work she's done and how she's got here and, and from my perspective it's almost more of what she does for other people through a lot of the social media things and, and the blogs and the, the, the patient advocate stuff but I think that's what's the most impressive is really how much that connects with others and, and really helps them. This is the realistic side of, of this disease but it's also made me a stronger better person and that's something that I think people can I think that's something that really can resonate with people. What do you get when you bring together a high school English teacher, a rapper, and a graphic artist? A place where talented young people can create and be inspired by those who've made it. This collective frame of mind is all about the free space they're given to express themselves. Pretty much just said, hey, like, I used your songs in my class and my kids are excited. To my excitement, Sam, like, replied back, like, almost immediately. Milwaukee's own Free Space is a monthly showcase that pairs youth artists with established artists in the city in hopes of curating a community and culture. Welcome everybody to Free Space February Jesus of The purpose of these events is to expose Milwaukee's youth to Milwaukee-based art and to provide them with the opportunity to appreciate that art. With From me. there, we met at Fuel Cafe in River West, and Vince spoke to me about just all these things, just such organization I was already impressed with. I saw from him of what to talk about. Just, it was like a lot of theory talking, what we could do, you know, going next, you know? And it's like free space has taught me and helped my, myself as a person, as far as friends and musically, like learning things that I didn't learn as far as like a copyright, your music, getting on iTunes, actually making money. That's, that's what's here at free space. So like with music, it was like, I can say what I want, like, First starting out, I didn't want to cuss because I was still scared to play it for my dad or my mom if they heard me cussing. But then like when it really became fully myself and an expression of myself, I felt like I could say whatever and it empowered me. And like, you can't just judge it based off what I say. You have to like, you are doing actually sit down and ask me because just like you have to understand a author that wrote a certain textbook, you have to understand the author of this. And it's like the same thing and it's giving kids power, confidence. It's the initiative, you know, people, people sure. show initiative and people hold each other accountable. And I cannot emphasize enough and stress enough how beautiful it's been to watch some of these youth grow into these incredible artists. You have to, you have to find an a environment that gives you that freedom of mind, you know what I mean? Like, yo, I can finally focus on being me, you know what I mean? Doing what I love here. Once I saw performers, you know what I mean? And, how the energy was set, you know what I mean? How the love is shown, you know what I mean, locally. It was like, this is dope. The, the movement is positive. It's just pushing the generation, you know what I mean? It's just pushing away from the violence, away from the nonsense that's going on, you know what I mean? So give people a positive role, you know what I mean? Give them a positive vision, you know what I mean? And let them know that, hey, there's people out here that appreciates, you know what I mean, people that works hard. When Sean says, let me be me, and all it really means is like, this is a space where I can exercise who I am without, without impunity and without restrictions. And that, that that's so rare is sad, but it's so beautiful that we can offer that. It felt, it felt amazing, man. Like for people to just really like appreciate my art and they don't even know me. You know what I mean? They were saying I was like, I was real political. I was talking about today's problems and whatnot. And like, even though like everybody was rapping, Nobody was talking about subject matter. When you when you saying something and you you saying something with purpose, a lot of people don't listen to it. Different than the next guy. I used to come just because I wanted to see the performances and I wanted to come show out myself. But now I just feel like I'm a part of the family. You know what I mean? Like to be one of the people that really saw it from like the beginning and stuff. Like I am now amazed to really see how big it's become. It's extremely like simple from an educational point of view. You set people up for success and they rise to the occasion. For me, it was the initial purpose. I knew that there needed to be a next generational thing for yeah. all the cool stuff that was happening in the Milwaukee hip hop scene. There needs to be a next tool sharing, yeah. helping these dudes, girls, whatever, like just learn how to 
operate in the industry and operate with themselves. And I'm always here for music and culture evolving, like, period. Tell us what you think about the stories seen here on 1036. Call us at 414-797-3760 and give us your feedback. And remember, check us out on Facebook and at milwaukeepbs.org. That'll do it for this edition of 1036. We return April 19th with a follow-up special on lead and our health. We'll see you next month right here on Milwaukee PBS.